I've got this long running series where I rank every legendary creature printed into Commander in 2022, and I've got some questions about how I actually evaluate each legendary creature. So I'll explain how to evaluate a commander and what I think makes good commander design. Before I start, two disclaimers. First, I'm going to say some negative things about some very popular commanders. And if you play these because you think they're fun, that's alright. We don't have to agree on everything. I don't want to discourage anyone from playing a commander that they enjoy. At the end of the day, I'm going to try and take an objective look at these commanders. But if you play a commander because you like the art, or the lore, or any other particular reason, then that's fine. The most important thing for a commander deck is that you find it fun to play. The second disclaimer is that you should definitely subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Alright, there are two sliding scales I like to place cards on. One is power level, and the second is interesting deck building decisions that the commander calls for. So what actually makes a commander powerful? Well, it can be a lot of things. Combo potential, how big is it? where it gives resources. A card that's a big creature that draws cards is better than a very big creature because it gives resources in hand and on board. There are lots of factors that can make a commander powerful. Usually if it cheats on mana, that could be another one. It's really difficult to just put a succinct list, but if I had to summarize it, if the commander gives resources in many different places, cards in hand, it's big on the board, it makes your other things bigger, and also gains you life, it's probably really powerful. Giving resources in all these different ways makes a card really strong. Or if it just draws a lot of cards. Honestly, card advantage in the command zone is one of the big things I look at when evaluating how powerful a commander is. Consistent card advantage in this format is really, really, really strong. And it doesn't have to exactly draw cards. Muldrotha is kind of drawing your cards. You get to cast like your whole graveyard. It's not literally drawing cards, but it's like pseudo card advantage. So keep that in mind when I'm evaluating the power level of these the commanders. It is based on a lot of different things and is a bit subjective. But I think you'll see that the ones that I say are very, very powerful are usually ones that provide some sort of card advantage because I think those are the best. Some legendary creatures just don't function in Commander. The Domain Legends from Dominaria United, for example. Because of the color identity rule, you can't just throw in other lands to make these commanders better. I know you have access to Urborg and Yavimaya, which don't actually have a color identity technically associated with them, so you could play them in the deck to give you more basic land types, but still most of these commanders can't reach their full power in Commander, or you need to jump through a lot of hoops to get there. And even if they were able to get the full 5 domain, none of them are still particularly good in EDH anyway. Because they don't function well in Commander, they fall so far behind on the power scale, it's pretty much not worth to even play them. Another example of commanders that don't function in Commander is the Neon Dynasty Myogens. They only work when you cast from hand, which is initially a way to stop you from reanimating them, but it also means that when you put them in the command zone, if you cast them from the command zone, it doesn't really work. Which really sucks because they were in the commander set, not even the main set. Honestly, they should just say if they were cast, not cast from hand, then it would actually work. I don't mind having to jump through hoops to get a bonus, that can be fun and interesting, but when the hoop jumping is just to make the card function in the format, it's not quite the same. I know this section sounds weird, but let me try to explain. Korvald does a thing. He sacrifices permanence on ETB and attack, and then rewards you for doing the thing. When you sacrifice something, draws you a card and he gets a counter. He can sacrifice anything, right? Creatures, artifacts, lands, whatever. And the benefit you get is kind of anything as well, right? It's just a counter and a card. You don't need any specific synergies to make that good. Card draw's always good. The openness of this ability means you can play him however you want, and it makes him very, very powerful, because everything that sacrifices will get value. But at the end of the day, it makes him kind of boring. There's nothing in this deck that's pulling you one way or another. For some players, unrestricted power is a good thing, but for me, it screams generic. He's just the sacrifice guy. 
Let's compare Korvald to Narsi. Narsi is the new Saga commander. I made a whole separate video all about her. If you want to check out that deck, it's pretty sweet. I'll put a card here. She drains people when Sagas finish and draws a card when an enchantment is sacrificed. So obviously she works well with Sagas because you draw a card when they finish because they sacrifice themselves and you get to drain. But that first effect just works on any enchantment, which means you can play cards like Oratog and Rancor to cycle the same Rancor over and over again to draw a bunch of cards, or sacrificing and looping enchantment creatures with Constellation. Enchantments other than Sagas don't normally sacrifice themselves, so that first line of text is really interesting to brew around. And that's why I like Narsi a lot more as a sacrifice commander, because she's still open enough that there's a bunch of different things you can do, but you can't just throw a pile of things that generically sacrifice themselves and make it work. You actually need synergy. And Narsi is just the reward. She doesn't do the thing. She doesn't sacrifice enchantments by herself. You actually have to put the synergy pieces in your deck. Do it all commanders are also pretty boring, but they're often the most powerful. Kenrith the Return King is probably the most powerful legendary creature ever printed. He is so flexible. There are multiple tournament winning CDH builds that use him in very different ways. Some use his abilities as an infinite mana outlet, others use his abilities to generate value underneath a rule of law stacks lock. Try saying that five times fast. The problem with Kenrith is he really does do everything. Life gain, power on board, cards in hand, plus other utility. These abilities can target anyone as well, which makes Kenrith one of the best political commanders too. You can do anything with Kenrith, and that's why he sucks. This card is so boring, a random pile of cards plus Kenrith could probably beat some precons. He's just that strong by himself, and provides no specific synergies. Urza is also a kind of do-it-all type of commander. Urza can tap artifacts to create blue mana. He also makes an artifact, Construct, and lets you spend the excess mana with his activated ability. So it's ramp, card draw, and power on board. And he doesn't require you to do anything with the artifacts specifically, other than play them. And he makes mana, which lets you cast more artifacts, and if you run out of artifacts at hand, then just use his card draw effect. This generic power makes Urza one of the best commanders in the format as well, yet, even as an artifact aficionado, I have no interest in playing him as my commander. The do it all commanders, much like Korvald, are very far on the power scale. They're really strong, but on the interesting deck building choices, it's kind of towards the low end. Technically, you can do whatever you wanted with it. If the commander itself has no impact on your specific playstyle, then it doesn't really feel like it's your commander, just some value piece. Sometimes commanders do similar things to other commanders sometimes in the same colors. I mean, how many Boros equipment commanders do we have? And when we get a new one, I'm just not interested. Yeah, some might be more powerful or work a slightly different angle, but it's all about the same. I just don't see myself getting excited about Boros equipment commander number 45. Part of the problem is that we get so many more products each year and each of them have a huge focus on commander. So we get way more legends than before and with the increased amount of legends and the wizards team not really increasing, we're bound to get more overlap in effects. I don't think it's bad that we have 15 different Boros equipment commanders, but I do think that it means we don't need Boros equipment commander number 16. So these can land anywhere on the power scale, but on the like interesting deck building scale, it's something we've had for so long, it doesn't really fascinate me. On to some good commander designs. Let's look at Galazeth Prismari. At first glance, looks a bit like Urza, but there are a few key differences. First off, Galazeth gives the ability to the artifact. It's not tap an artifact, make a blue, uh, which means that artifact creatures can't tap immediately with Galazeth, whereas they could with Urza. But more importantly, Galazeth only lets you use the mana on instants and sorceries. This means your deck asks for two things artifacts and instants and sorceries. So you need to strike a balance. You can either have you know, instants and sorceries that make artifacts like treasure producing ones. You could play artifacts that synergize with instants and sorceries. Galazeth asking you for these two different things pulls your deck into two different directions. And the way you lean on that scale will affect your deck. Are you more instants and sorceries? You could be more of a spell slinger deck, or you could go heavy on artifacts and just try and use them to power out some big spell finishers. Either way, it's going to cause your Galzeth deck 
to look different than someone else's because there are these two opposite ends pulling. Raph Weatherlight Stalwart is another commander that asks two things of you. He wants you to cast instants and sorceries, but also have tokens to get the reward. Finding the balance between that is going to determine how your deck functions and make your version of Raph unique. I love commanders that ask two different things of you because it really makes me start brewing like what would it look like if I leaned one way or another. Some commanders do what we've seen before but add a twist to it and make the deck interesting. Some do the opposite. The Ur Dragon, I think, is the opposite. It's one of the most popular commanders ever and probably the most powerful Dragon Tribal commander, yet the most boring. Eminence might be the worst mechanic for commander. Although partner gives it a good run for its money, uh, one of those has got to be the worst. Let me know in the comments below. Eminence commanders don't need to be cast. Their effect works in the command zone. The Ur Dragon asks nothing of you other than to be playing good dragons. Whatever the best ones are, because they just cost one less, which just makes them better. Now let's compare the Ur Dragon to the OG Dragon tribal commander, Scion of the Ur Dragon. I think Scion is a lot more interesting. Scion can turn into any dragon by putting a dragon from your deck into the graveyard. This doesn't encourage you to just jam all the highest value dragons, but instead a suite of dragons with unique effects. Silimgar the Drifting Death to deal with tokens, or Belladros to untap your lands if you need a burst of mana, or maybe Teneb the Harvester to reanimate one of the dragons that you put in the bin with Scion. Honestly, you could just do a reanimator build as well. Scion of the Ur Dragon is a unique, interesting take on Dragon Tribal. And as new dragons come with unique effects, it would change how the deck operates. Generically powerful tribal commanders are generally very samey. All the decks kind of look the same. So I really love when commanders are not just good stuff, but want synergies or specific effects. The Ur Dragon is definitely more powerful than the Scion, but I would argue that Scion is a much more interesting deck to build. Some great commanders are just unique. The five color Omnath is a very unique card. The mana floating ability does call back to the original Omnath, but this five color version asks you to play cards with multiple color pips. Kind of like a devotion deck, but for five colors? This is a totally separate effect that we've never seen before on a card. You can play multicolored matters or X spells with your banked mana or actual devotion if you wanted to lean into any one color. Omnath Locus of All is a sweet commander that really causes you to brew in different ways. And as we get more cards with triple color pips, more things can go into the deck and it can change and evolve a lot over time. Sometimes mono blue might feel the same. A lot of people are just thinking, eh, counter spells, bounce spells, blah, blah, right? But Watcher in the Water puts a pretty unique spin on mono blue control. Watcher asks you to draw a card on each player's turn, which already is something a little different. You don't want big draw spells. You want stuff that lets you draw here and there and here and there to make all these little tentacles. And then when the tentacles die, you get to put stun counters on creatures. So you might want a sacrifice outlet to sacrifice those. And then you could play proliferate effects to put more stun counters on things. It's still a mono blue control deck. But instead of relying on counter spells and bounce spells, you can make removal by killing those tentacles after drawing cards on other players' turns and then proliferating counters. A really special, unique spin on mono blue control. Commanders like this are awesome because it still feels very blue. It doesn't feel like a color pie break, it's still a mono blue control deck, but it does really work differently and ask you to play different cards. All right, so I've rambled on for probably way too long. So what's my whole point? Well, on one hand, nothing. I just like talking about magic, and if you have fun with whatever commander, stick with that. But I do think that the rise of these generically powerful commanders like Kenrith, Ur-Dragon, uh, Golos before he got banned, does show something wrong with the design philosophy of the game right now. You see, we're getting a lot of cards that are generically powerful, snowball the effects that just work on their own. They don't really require any specific synergies. Cards like Ragavan are really one of the best examples of this. It's an absolute wall of text on one card. Uh, the One Ring is another example of this. It's just really powerful by itself. And it's a problem for other formats, but for commanders specifically, it makes decks more boring because if cards are generically powerful, you just play your cards and sort of mid-range it out. Whereas commander used to be a home for all of your old 
like bad bulk rares. And you would find synergy pieces and use themes or archetypes that weren't really able to make it in standard. Instead of generically powerful cards, in Commander I want to see a lot more synergy pieces. Cards that ask you to play a specific type of thing so that you can brew around it. More Narsi type effects, less generic Korvald effects. It causes you to have to dig deep into the game's history and find strange cards that you normally wouldn't play, like Orotog for example. I hope my explanation on how I view commanders will inspire you to play something interesting. Not powerful, but interesting. Ultimately, look, play whatever you have the most fun with, even if it's the most generic elf ball deck of all time. Let me know your favorite commanders and how you evaluate them in the comments below. Thank you so very much for watching, subscribe for more.